Got you in suspense, don't I? Well, let me start by asking, how many people recognize the, that movie, Raise Your Hand, okay? How, keep your hands up if you recognize the movie. Uh, how many of you that have your hand raised are under 40 years old? Uh, Yeah, yeah. So that's, that, that's the movie Chariots of Fire, and I wanted to show the 400-meter uh, uh, dash that Eric Little was in. That was Eric Little. It's actually a true story portrayed about Eric Little in the 1924 Olympics. If you don't haven't seen the movie, don't know the story. It's, a, again, a very true story. But in 1924, Eric Little uh, was a Scottish uh, runner, who qualified for the Olympics in the 100-meter race. And he was expected to win the gold, the first gold for, for Scotland. And they just so happened the test trials for the 100 meters was on a Sunday. And Eric had a very strong conviction that Sunday was his Sabbath and he would not uh, participate in something on the Sabbath. And so he decided to withdraw he had a lot of political pressure. He had a lot of pressure from even his family members that he should go ahead and do this. But he decided, no, I'm not going to do that. And the Olympic Committee decided, okay, well, you can run in another race. You can't run in the 100 meters if you're not going to participate in the trial. You can pick another race. Uh, actually, they picked a race for him, the 400 meters. And so he went to the time trial on a Monday for the 400 meters Barely qualified, but qualified to go into the 400-meter race. And that was the clip, if we were able to see the whole of it. He actually won the 400-meter race, expected not to even come close, but he set the world record uh, in the 400 meters. Uh, right before he was about to run, uh, one of his Jewish friends gave him a, a, an Old Testament, scriptures, Old Testament scripture where it says, he who honors me, I will honor. And he went on to, uh, to win the gold. Uh, you might know the rest of the story. He was a son of a missionary, became a missionary himself, uh, and died in a prisoner of war camp as a missionary. But I, I wanted to introduce Eric Little because I think that introduces to us uh, this idea of Sabbath. As we conclude our sermon series that Jesse's been leading us through over the past several weeks, we've been thinking a lot about this idea of Sabbath, our, our Sabbath rest, and Jesse's walked us through how it, it was created by God, and then it was instructed of how that's supposed to uh, work itself out with God's love and His work for us. Uh, and then he talked about last week the provision for the Sabbath and how Jesus was the fulfillment of the Sabbath, this idea of resting in God. And so today, uh, I'm going to talk about some practical things or practical aspects of the Sabbath. And so I, I titled the, the sermon today, Principles for Christian Sabbath or for Sabbath Practice. And I was very intentional by using that word, pra uh, or using that word principles uh, because I, I, I do think it's a principle, not a commandment uh, when it comes to the idea of a Sabbath. And maybe you know this, but just to kind of give you the idea of, uh, of the idea of the different beliefs about the Christian Sabbath, there's two questions I wanted to try to answer before I talk about the principles. And number one is, what are the Christian beliefs about the Sabbath? My guess is even in this room right here, there's a spectrum of beliefs about the Sabbath and how it applies to me as a Christian. And then I thought it would also be helpful just to kind of give you the biblical background of why, why do we go to church on Sunday? Why does every Christian pretty much, for the most part, uh, go, to, go to church on Sunday when the day of rest in the Old Testament was a Saturday? Saturday's the seventh day. So I think it's helpful just to have a uh, biblical reasoning of that in our mind. So let me try to answer those questions, and you can take them off the screen there if you want. Cheryl, but uh, question number one is what are the Christian beliefs about the Sabbath? And, and let me just present it maybe as a, as a spectrum of beliefs. So, you know, on one side of the spectrum of Christian beliefs about the Sabbath is that the fourth commandment about keeping a day of rest, keeping the Sabbath, still applies to Christians. 
And it still applies even on Saturday. You've probably heard of Seventh-day Adventists. That's one of the uh, more common denominations that believe this, that, that the Sabbath is the fourth commandment is still applicable and it's still on a Saturday. You should rest and worship. Those are the two principles of the Sabbath. You should rest and worship on a Saturday. I would say maybe in the middle uh, of the uh, spectrum is uh, what the, what's called maybe Sabbatarians, m- meaning that now the Sabbath should be on Sunday, the Lord's Day, but the principles of the, sta- the, the not, a, not the principles, but the commandments, uh, the commandment of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, uh, applies on a Sunday, meaning you should do no work on, on a Sunday. Like literally, you shouldn't go out to eat on a Sunday because then you're causing other people to work. So that's more of a middle-of-the-ground, Sabbatarian kind of view. Um, and then there's probably the, the other end of the spectrum, and maybe uh, many evangelical Christians would identify uh, this way, where they believe that the Sabbath has been fulfilled, and so the fourth commandment is true in principle, but it's not true as a commandment. If you look at the New Testament, for example, all of the other commandments are mentioned in the New Testament except for the Sabbath. They're all reaffirmed in the New Testament except for uh, the Sabbath. And you could argue that a little bit, sure. And so uh, I would say if you don't have any rhythm of worship in the, or rest in your, in, in your life, you're sort of off the spectrum. You know, if you're a Christian, uh, it seems to be clear that you should have worship and rest in your life. If you don't have any rest or worship... Um, A, you're not practicing as a a Christ follower, but B, you're going to be dead if you don't have any rest in your life. God commanded rest. Uh, God, rest was God's idea. He rested on the seventh day, and it says in the Old Testament, he rested and was refreshed. We're made in his image. We need to be refreshed ourselves. And so uh, that is the sort of the the spectrum of, of different thoughts about Sabbath there. For the record, I, I probably I'm probably right here. That, that's kind of where I'm at. Like I, I, I'm not uh, I'm not a commandment guy, uh, I, and I'm not you know uh, way over where it's uh, I have a day of rhythm and every day is the Sabbath for me. Uh, I, I would say I, I'm right here. And let, let me be clear. I don't think my job today is to convince you to be right here with me. Uh, my job today is, though, to ask you, are you convinced in your own mind that your rhythm of worship and rest is right? Because that's what the Scripture says. Each person should be convinced in their own mind. Let me, let me give you a couple of Scriptures that allude to that. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Colossians 2, 16 says this, So don't let anyone judge you about eating or drinking or about a festival, a new moon, observance, or Sabbaths. In other words, there's going to be some discretion here, and there's going to be difference of thought about about Sabbaths, if you will. And then Romans 14, 5 through 6, Jesse alluded to this already, uh, but this says uh, about uh, thinking of the Sabbath. It says, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. And this is what I was talking about. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind or fully convicted. You should have a conviction about a rhythm of rest and worship uh, in in your life. One who observes a day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. In other words, there's a... Uh, there, there should be a pattern, a rhythm, and rest, but you know, don't let someone judge you. You should be convinced and have your own uh, conviction uh, about that. And so, again, I hope that you'll come to your own conviction about a rhythm of worship uh, and rest in your life. Uh, question number two, why, why do we worship on Sunday? So uh, why do we not think that Saturday uh, is the Sabbath? And, uh, you know, let me just back up a little bit and say, how, how did it come to be known that the day of rest should also be a, a day of worship? And, it, and really that started in Leviticus shortly after the Ten Commandments were given, and God says, don't work on the, the seventh day. Uh, Leviticus expounds that or 
talks about that more. And it says that uh, the day, the Sabbath day, should be a day of holy convoca- convocation or holy assembly. And then Isaiah sort of reiterated that, that the Sabbath should be a time where God's people come together, gather together to worship. And then we see that most exemplified by the time that Jesus comes. Listen to this about Jesus and his uh, obeying the Sabbath. Uh, Luke 4, verse 16. Luke 4, 16. It says, And Jesus, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he made a habit of going to synagogue on the Sabbath, as it was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up there to read. And so we see that the Sabbath day became a day of rest and it became a day of worship. Well, how did that go from Saturday to Sunday? Well, let me make it a long story short. Uh, but what day did Jesus rise from the dead? Sunday. Uh, what day of the week was the church born on? Sunday. I, I was reminded of this was uh, kudos out to Bob Jinnock because I had forgotten that. But the church was born on Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. And Pentecost happened 50 days after uh, another festival on the Sabbath. Uh, so the Sabbath was Saturday. So 7 times 7 is 49 at a day Sunday. And then as you read the New Testament, you see in the book of Acts and then in the other New Testament books where it says the Christians gathered on what day? The first day of the week to worship. And then finally, in the oldest New Testament book, the book of Revelation, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Sunday had become the Lord's day. Didn't say the Lord's morning, interestingly. The Lord's day. And so that's how we came about uh, for the Sabbath to go from Saturday to Sunday. And I, just to be candid, I wish the Bible would give us a little more reasoning behind God's thought on that. The best speculation I've ever heard, this is good, is that if you read the Old Testament, it, it, it's law-oriented, obviously. It's works-oriented. And so you work, 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 rest. The New Testament is faith, grace oriented. And so in the Old Testament, you worked so that you could find rest in God. In the New Testament, the New Covenant, you rest in God and what he's finished and done in his son, Christ Jesus. And then your works should flow out of that. And you know, good, good speculation. I mean, but if you don't understand that, you don't really understand Christianity. You know, the Bible says we're, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works. We, we can't be good enough. We can't go to church every Sunday and be a Christian. We can't go to church uh, every day of the week and be, be saved. We, we, don't, we don't do that to become a Christian to know that we're going to heaven. We, we become a Christian by putting our faith in Christ and then what happens? We, we obey God because we've been accepted by God. In the Old Testament, you obey God to get accepted, works, and then rest. It, New Testament is you are accepted by God through your faith in Christ, and out of that flow your works. That's why it goes on to say, after it says you're saved by grace through faith, it says we are, God, we are a, new, we're a creation in Christ created for what? Good works. So works flow out of a relationship with God. And that, that's Christianity. It's not about being good enough. It's uh, your obedience comes because you've been made righteous through your faith in Christ. And so uh, that's where uh, perhaps, the, uh, you know, perhaps a, the Sabbath came from. So let me give four principles this morning. Four Again, principles for your Sabbath and how you want to put a, a, a source of rhythm of worship and rest in your life. So here they are, four, four principles here, and then we'll try to unpack each of these. Uh, first of all, I'd suggest some type of rhythm of worship and rest in your life. 
Um, and I would say that, parenthetically, that's plan time. In other words, you've got you to gotta plan that. It just doesn't happen. You have some plan time for rest and worship in your life. Uh, e, uh, an acronym for rest here, E is you should enjoy God on, on this Sabbath that you have. You should enjoy God and His gifts. S is for stop. The idea is you, you stop working. You stop. And then T, uh, it should be a time with God and then a time with God's people. A time with God and, and a time with God's people. So let me help us think about those four principles this morning. First, and, first of all, there should be a rhythm to it. it should have, you should have some planned time in, in your life where you are planning on worshiping and planning on resting. You know, uh, overwork, uh, to state the obvious, uh, is not a healthy spiritual perspective, but it's also not a, a health, healthy physical perspective. You know, I, I can attest to this in my other line of work. I'm a nurse, and so uh, I think it's uh, easy to see, and, and it's almost common sense now, uh, we don't really need studies to show this, but if you go nonstop and you do not rest, you, you will fall apart. I mean, there's lots of uh, scientific data out there that connects overwork and lack of rest to heart disease, to heart arrhythmias, um, some of the other things, health issues that it's directly tied to uh, is what they call adrenal insufficiency, your, your cortisol, your adrenaline's going nonstop. And so that uh, messes up your endocrine system, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, uh, concentration, uh, anxiety, depression. I mean, again, you, you don't need a, a, a scientific study to, to tell you this, but I mean, there's plenty of scientific studies that, that do show if you go nonstop without rest, it's going to lead to a breakdown physically and a breakdown spiritually. And, and, and getting ready for this, I came across a somewhat recent study, University of Florida, and they just did a study on creativity. And uh, they had this, you know, uh, this category of what was considered creative. Uh, but they found that 40 to 50 percent of what they would classify as creative ideas, 40 to 50 percent of those did not happen when you were doing normal work things. And the categories for working did include like binge watching Netflix. You couldn't be engaging your mind. You couldn't be uh, scrolling through your social media. You, you, you couldn't be reading. So they had some very strict categories of what they considered uh, rest time. Uh, things like exercise. Uh, light exercise, you couldn't be like really strenuously exercising, uh, taking a walk or driving in places where there's not traffic, so you're on kind of cruise control mentally as well, uh, taking, uh, I think I said that, taking a walk in the shower was uh, another uh, criteria for, you know, active rest as they called it. But interestingly, they, they noted that um, people's creativity and creative ideas, which I think we've all experienced this. How many of you had a, an idea in the shower or an idea on a walk or you're driving and you, you, know, you feel the, the Lord speaking to you and uh, our creative idea or that, that problem that you're having that you didn't know how to answer? You know, I, I've had, you know, even recently waking up after praying about something and immediately I, I sensed the Lord, you know, speaking to me about how I needed to handle, handle that issue. And so, you know, rest needs to be built into our life. And I think that's, you know, God's purpose in that. John Calvin said, you know, there's three reasons that you have to have a Sabbath. One is to be reminded for what Jesus uh, did for you. Uh, two is uh, that you have a day together and worship the Lord. But three is because you need rest. And you need God to re re refresh you. But we see this in the, in the fourth commandment. And uh, the Jewish people uh, um, just uh, trying to correspond with this. But listen to Exodus uh, chapter 16. And I think Jesse alluded to these verses in the first sermon that he did. He says, 
Uh, but this is how God worked it out with the uh, Jewish people and practicing the Sabbath when they were in the wilderness and he was supernaturally providing food for them, manna. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And so, if you know the rest of the story, day six, Friday, Saturday coming, they would go out and they would gather enough food for Friday and Saturday. And on Saturday, the food would be good. If they went out on day two, for example, and gathered two days worth, on day three, the, it says that the food stank, it spoiled. So, so God in his provision uh, didn't want, wanted them to get their daily bread every day, not hoard it. In other words, trust him, he's going to provide every day. But on the sixth day, you need to get two days because on the seventh day, I don't want you to do any work. And so, again, I think the principle here is that you have to plan some rest in your life. You have to uh, plan a, a Sabbath, if you will. And I think that's the, uh, the principle that, that he's doing. And let me be candid again. You got, there's some trust that's involved in that. You know, you're going to have to maybe give up some things and not do some things. Uh, it, it might even cost you financially. You know, Chick-fil-A, Truett Cathy, they don't open on Sundays, as you might know. Do you know why they don't open Sunday, on Sundays? Because Truett Cathy believed that Sunday was a Christian Sabbath. And he wanted his employees to be able to worship. And he wanted to worship on the Sabbath. You know how much that costs Chick-fil-A a year? $1.2 to $1.5 billion a year by, by not opening on Sunday. And $300 million every Sunday. But in his autobiography, uh, Truett said this. He says, it was worth the risk. God has honored my decision to keep the Sabbath. And because of that, listen to this. Because of that, he has given me unexpected opportunities for greater work. Unexpected opportunities for greater work. You know, it's, it's similar to our... Our finances, we, we, God can do more with less percent than he can do with your 100% in the same way, as, same way with your time. And, and God asks you to trust him and find a day where you can give it to worship and to give it to his rest. So principle number one is find a rhythm. Find a rhythm for your worship and find a ris- rhythm for your rest. Uh, principle number two is to enjoy God and his gifts. What, what's the Sabbath for? It, it's to enjoy it. It's to delight in God. Listen to how Isaiah talked about the Sabbath. Uh, Isaiah 58 says this, If you turn, your foot, or turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, in other words, he's not saying don't do anything that's pleasurable, He's saying, don't make it about you. Don't make it about your selfish ambition. And, and you make and, you, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Oh, quote the Westminster Catechism here. Maybe someone knows the answer. What's the chief end of men? Of men? To glorify God and what? Enjoy Him forever. To quote a, another theologian, John Piper, who's made his whole ministry about this, God is most glorified when we were most satisfied or delighting in Him, most enjoying Him. And I think there's a truth to that. God, God wants you to enjoy Him. And He wants you to enjoy His gifts. And, the, and, and you should set apart some time where that's your focus. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to enjoy God and, and the gifts that He's given 
you. I mean, just as we, you know, enjoy other things, uh, we should uh, enjoy him. You know, I think Jordan Mayer gave a, a great example of uh, our analogy, I should say, of, of resting in the Lord. I hope you read the church emails and read the devotionals from different daybreakers. Jordan was the person who wrote the devotional this week. And he, I think I, it, I could relate because he was talking about he got the flu. I'd recently gotten the flu. And he said the worst part about it was you just can't sleep. And he remembers the first night, finally, after days of not sleeping and getting a full night's rest and waking up and the joy of that. And um, I, I think that is, you know, I think that is a good analogy of, uh, of what rest should feel like in the Lord. And he quoted Hebrews chapter 4 where it says, strive to enter into his rest. You know, strive to have a time where you're focused on God and just enjoying him. And we have lots of analogies uh, of how that should work and enjoying his gifts, that, but really those gifts should point us back to him. And an analogy that came to my mind because at the beginning of the year, I, I changed my diet. Um, I uh, doing more of a plant-based diet this year. But but this is this is my own diet. I'm going to write my bestseller whenever I lose a hundred more pounds. But it says uh, it's because it's called the uh, whole food plant-based Sabbath diet. And the reason I call it that is because I take one day to not be plant-based. And um, I have to have to say, if you don't eat a hamburger for a while and then on the seventh day uh, or the first day of the week in my situation you eat a hamburger that is like the best hamburger that you can ever eat my I, I, I'm on that diet my, this is self-deprecating but my primary care physician I uh, decided to do this diet because he wrote me an email he's, he's a friend and I know it, but he wrote me an email. He's like, after I saw you, I was looking at your, your weight, your cholesterol, um, and your phenotype, he said, um, male pattern baldness in parentheses. I was thinking, you know, we could think about your cholesterol in this way, that way. And I, and I have to admit, I was like, that's offensive. But true, but true. So I wrote him back and I said, okay, I'm fat and bald, but you're ugly. No, I actually, I, I, I changed, uh, I changed, just decided to make a change in, in the way I was going to eat. But I, all that to say is um, there is something joyful now about celebrating that hamburger every Sunday. And I think it's a, a fair analogy to are, are we delighting in God on our Sabbath? We know how to love hamburgers, but do we know how to love God? We know how to enjoy hamburgers but we do we do we know how to enjoy god and, and let me be clear that that sometimes takes some practice it, it takes discipline uh you know freedom freedom isn't to be able to do whatever you want biblical freedom is to be able to do what's best and what's right and so the, the i'm just going to be honest that the, the the, the practice of the Sabbath takes some discipline. You know, you know, just like the guitarist doesn't get up here and, you know, play every song they want to play like that. It took some practice. Now they can get up here and play whatever song they want to play. But it took some practice to do that. And so is, so is it with the Sabbath, you know. F figure it out. You know, come to your own conviction. Uh, maybe it's not Sunday. I mean... Pastors usually don't do it on a Sunday. I know Jesse's Sabbath is on a Monday. But, but, but figure it out where you have a day or a rhythm of some kind where you can enjoy God and enjoy His gifts and enjoy resting. So enjoy God and enjoy His gifts. And then, then the third principle, and that, that third principle is just to stop. Quit working. Quit doing work at some places in your life. You know, I, I have to admit, I, I didn't want to preach this sermon. Uh, usually, Jesse gives us opportunities. Uh, like, he usually will do a sermon series, say, Brent, which one do you want out of this? 
And, I, you know, one of the joys of being an assistant pastor is I get to cherry pick the sermons I want to preach and not preach the ones I don't want to preach. But I, I felt bad because last December I was supposed to have a sermon on uh, the Jesus being our everlasting father. But I had to text Jesse on a Saturday morning and say, listen, I got the flu. You got Sunday. And so he didn't whine, he didn't complain. And, but that's like the pastor's worst nightmare. You got your Saturday planned, you haven't studied all week, and you, you, you got to do it. So anyway, I was like, I'll take one for the team, since you took one for the team. And I, I'll, I'll do the one that I don't want to do. But you know why I didn't want to do it? Because I'm not good at it. I'm just going to be honest. I, I, I find rest in doing a, a lot of ways. And so I've had to struggle and still am practicing to figure out my right rhythm uh, of worship and rest. But stop means stop. Stop working. Listen again to the the commandment, to the fourth commandment, Exodus uh, chapter 20. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall do all your emails, do all of your housework, do all of those to-do lists, But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Interestingly, it does say to work six days. Sometimes us in American culture, we leisure more than we should. But on it you shall not do any work. You, your son, and then goes on and on and on and talks about uh, making it holy. But, But not doing any work means not doing any work. And you're going to have to figure out that rhythm in your life. How, how do I, uh, in a day of 24-7 phone in my pocket, constant notifications, do I turn my phone off maybe? Do I not go to this place maybe? Do I, you have to figure that conviction out for yourself. But, but stop uh, does mean stop. And Jesus said, don't go overboard with this. You know, that was the thing about the Pharisees. They, they made their own little man-made rules about what you could do and you couldn't do on the Sabbath. And he says, if your ox falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, what do you do? You get him out. So in your personal convictions, don't go that crazy about it, but, but have some convictions about it. To be clear, if your ox is falling into your pit every Sunday, get rid of that ox. <laughs> you you got to have time to stop. And Jesus says, you know, be, be, be prudent about it, be discerning about it, but don't not do it. Don't not do it. We've got to make the time. And then the fourth principle, the fourth principle being on your Sabbath, you have to have time with God and God's people. You have to have time with God and God's people. Hebrews, the same book that talks about Jesus fulfilling the Sabbath, uh, Hebrews 10 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching, the day approaching me when Christ returns there. And so another principle for the Sabbath uh, is to spend time with God and to spend time with God's people. You've probably heard me tell the story before if you're a veteran daybreaker, but it's the story of a pastor who went to visit a church member who hadn't been to church in a while. And that's an awkward conversation that we pastors get to have. But the story is told of a a, a pastor who noticed that one of uh, the church members hadn't been there in a long while. So on his way home from church, he stopped by the person's home and uh, they were home. And uh, the man opened the door And obviously he was surprised. Here's the pastor right after church stopping by my house. And for the record, we do that a lot here at Daybreak. If you're 
watching online today. Um, just kidding. I've never done that. But um, here, you know, here's the man, kind of an awkward situation. Uh, it's a cold day, kind of like today. He invites the pastor in, and he sits down by the fire with the pastor, and it was just awkward silence there. And so the pastor got up, went to the fireplace, took a tong, grabbed an ember out of the burning fire, and he took the ember and he pulled it out of the fireplace and put it on the bricks outside the fireplace. And the ember just sat there, and after several minutes, the ember was, you know, was glowing from the fire, stopped glowing. And so then the pastor took the ember and then took it back over, put it back in the fireplace, and then the ember started glowing again. And then he sat down, and the guy looked at his pastor and he says, I get it. I'll see you in church next Sunday. I, I, I've told that story several times because I'm biased. I'm a pastor. I want people to come to church. But I believe that story with all my heart. All my heart. COVID, COVID proved it true to me. And I say this respectfully, but I, I know people who lost their minds when they forsook the gathering of God's people together. One, one of the ways that we have a rhythm of worship is we have a rhythm of meeting with God and His people at the same time. You know, I started off with a poll of showing our generational differences, but let, let me do another one. How many of you remember Blue Laws? If you're under 30 and remember Blue Laws, you don't really remember Blue Laws. Blue Laws were in existence in almost every state until the 1970s when they started being repealed. But Blue Laws made it illegal for a store to open on a Sunday in America. And so literally, it was against the law to, to, to be open on a Sunday in America. I heard one church historian say this, and I don't know, I think it's a little dramatic, but it, was, it got my attention. He goes, he goes, if Christianity continues to decline in America, and, I, and I'm a historian 200 years from now, he says, I think this could happen, that a historian is going to say, the mark of the decline of Christianity started in the 1970s, when blue laws started to be repealed one after another. I don't know if that's true. I, I personally have a sense that God's going to bring a revival to our country. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know that. I'm praying for that. And, and, and to be clear, I'm not, I'm not a legalist. I believe in personal legalism, but for the record. Like, I, I believe you've got to come to your own conviction about church your own conviction about alcohol, for example. I believe in personal legalism. And what I mean by that is, you know, something that might be a sin for me might not be a sin for you and vice versa. So I'm not saying that legalistically we should reenact blue laws. But, you know, just to give you a personal example, after my daughter's wedding last year, uh, we went nonstop for the wedding. The wedding was on a Saturday. We were probably three in the morning tearing down the, the venue, getting home. And um, that Sunday morning, I woke up, and I, I went to church. My wife, I said, do you want to go to church with me? She goes, I am dying. She says, you know, I, 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 I'm not getting up early. The church service that I wanted to go to was at 8 o'clock, a, a vineyard church in Kansas City, Missouri. But it, for me, I, zero doubt it was what the Lord wanted me to do. And the Lord spoke to me that day. So I, I, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to put into people legalism, but I am trying to say you've got to have some conviction here. You've got to have some rhythm of rest and worship in your life. You need to have some time with God and God's people. You don't have to have a Sabbath. You get to have a Sabbath. 
the Sabbath was made for man. Jesus said that. Do you have one? He gifted it to you. Do you have one? He made it for you and for me. And may we enjoy him. And may we enjoy him forever. Let's pray.